What's up, everybody? This is the very first Fishman and Kichi Presents stream. We've got animals leaders coming up today. All right, so once once we see our friends dialing in, we will we will let them in, and we will chat. So please do think of some questions for these two. Animals as Leaders is an incredible influence on me. I wish I could play like that is all I can say. You can see that I picked up the eight string strictly because of Animals as Leaders. That's exactly why I picked it up. So here's Javier right now. Yo. Yo. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, friends? How you guys doing? What's up, dude? How are you? Great to see you both. Thank you so much for doing this today. Yeah, no, no problem, pleasure, man. Dude. Heck yes, heck yes. I actually just retuned up my Abasi and it sounds freaking awesome. I think it's nice. like one of the best damn sounding guitars that I own. <laughs> nice, man. <laughs> yeah, guys. Well, everybody's super stoked. Everybody's been hyped up for this. They've got some questions. I've got some questions because I've never been able to chat to you guys too much as well. So let's start from the beginning. Origin story. When did each of you on your separate paths go... I dig music, I dig heavier music, or I st you started to see like, hey, I wanna, I wanna start playing music, music myself. Let me go first. Uh, I, got, I got my first guitar uh, at the age of 12. And this is when like Nirvana and Green Day and freaking Soundgarden and all, Pearl Jam, that was heavy rotation. That was guitar. Like if I heard a solo, it was cause it was in a Guns N' Roses song. Yeah. You know, or if I turned on classic rock i'd hear some van halen some zeppelin so more of the story is i was playing like alternative rock stuff and then that evolved you know metallica was putting out some top 40 hits at that time and i was hearing heavier stuff but um it wasn't until i guess the new metal period that i started to like want to play like heavier stuff and it wasn't like megadeth it was like death tones and like system of a down and stuff like that i was just really into that like newer sort of metal sound corn um and that made me want to get seven strings have i met him around the point uh, i was like 17 and uh he had already had a seven string i was uh he was singing in this band called psi it was very this it's was like, like six simple tourist slash slipknot ish yeah. Slayer. Yeah, Slayer wannabe sort of thing. That's awesome. So it was like, for me, this was like the most metal, you know, band I'd ever thought of being in. And he was singing in it, singing. Yeah. But um, turns out he was all sick at guitar and he had a crazy collection. He had it Ivan his universe. And that was my first time really like playing a really nice seven string. And so I got into playing seven and then I got into Dream Theater and I got into Ingve and I got into Vi and I got into Satch. And it was just this rabbit hole of like, you know, just kind of like advanced guitar shred techniques mixed with increasingly heavier music like Meshuga and Between the Barrier and Me and Candiria and stuff like that. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. How about you, Javier? Uh, for me, I so I started playing guitar at the age of six. Uh, my dad was just like, you have to go take lessons. Um, and it was at some little random mom and pop shop in uh, in DC. And fortunately, they had some ridiculously good teachers um, who were on top of just being good teachers. They were like, here, listen to this, listen to that. Um, probably by the age of like eight or t nine and 10, something like that is when I started like, you know, I would see me playing better than my older brother who was like six years older. Uh, I, I saw me playing better than any my friends in school and stuff like that who also played so i kind of just i liked it you know i kind of liked the attention at the same time um and then through my older brother and um like a few of his friends one friend in particular um who was way into like prog um you know he introduced me to like rush van halen yes kansas so i was probably like yeah 10 11 kind of listening to that stuff um and, you know, and I, I just thought it was cool. Like, um, I was, I got into guitar quite a bit at that point. Um, the whole, probably about the age of, I don't know, uh, 12 was when the, the whole alternative movement kind of started. And I was anti-alternative. I was just like, where are the solos? Like, you know, Nirvana came out and blew, changed all of music. Meanwhile, I was like, but a solo though. <laughs> <laughs> What happened to the solos? This guy doesn't even shred, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I was totally that guy. I was just like, 
kids are wearing fucking Soundgarden shirts and I was wearing the fucking, you know, Overkill and Hell Slayer yes. shirts and Testament shirts and shit like that. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, it, <laughs> but yo, I'm curious, you're a metalhead. Like what did you, were you pulled in by the fucking yeah, alternative so- rock stuff? My path was, I'm from Central Florida, and Central Florida, the biggest thing has always been like pop punk, boy bands, and new metal eventually. So when I was around 11 or so, that's when I started getting, first noticing I liked music, I get into pop punk. My first favorite band was Real Big Fish, Less Than Jake, Blink-182. Those are the first things I loved. I tried out for a band, like I was in seventh grade, I tried out for a bunch of eighth graders band. It's called Freshly Squeezed, of course, more Florida stuff. It was a ska <laughs> band. And I thought I, I thought I had it made. I thought I was in, I thought it was good. Um, my tryout song was Damn It by Blink-182. I didn't get the call back. So I was like, all right, screw guitar, I'm done with this. And I kind of gave up. About a month later, classmate, I think his name was Dave Martin. He lent me the Black Album by Metallica. I was like, what's this? I brought it home. I started listening to it. I was like, this is the kind of music that I should be playing. So I locked myself in my room, not aware that I was practicing, but just trying to emulate the sounds that I heard. So I was like, I'm going to play till I can play these things. Uh, I started getting kind of decent and I played my eighth grade talent show covering No Leaf Clover by Metallica because that was 99 is when I discovered metal, 98, 99. And um, played No Leaf Clover. Right afterwards, I was asked by a couple high school kids, they're like, hey, we just lost our lead guitar player when a metal band called Trivium. Do you want to try out? I was like, yeah, I'll try it for your band. What's the tryout song? Fruit in the Bell Tolls. I came up to Travis's house. I walked in. They're all like 15, 16. He's like the only kid I ever met. Not even kid. Guy I ever met with a tattoo who like smoked cigarettes. I was like, whoa, who's this adult male over here? And they're all looking at me like, what's this kid going to do? And I played the song perfectly. So their looks changed from one kind of look to another. And they're like, all right, you're in. So I was brought in as lead guitar player. We played Lake Brantley High School Battle of Bands. I think it was December 99 or maybe the beginning of 2000. We opened with Sick by Slipknot. Closed it for whom the bell tolls. Played a couple originals. And our original singer, he wanted our band to be an industrial band. He wanted to be like Skinny Puppy Ministry, Nine Inch Nails, Rammstein, that kind of thing. But we all wanted to be a metal band. Like Travis got me into Megadeth and Slayer and Pantera. And I said... I said, well, we want to be metal. Brad wanted to be industrial. He's like, how about this? We'll split the songs in half. You guys keep the band name. We'll go our separate ways. He started a band called Conjoined. We became Trivium and started playing around. And that's when Travis started getting me into more metal bands. Then I started discovering extreme metal, like discovering stuff like melodic death metal. That was a huge influence on me. In Flames, At the Gaze, Dark Tranquility, all the Gothenburg bands. Getting into death metal, some of the Florida stuff, some of the Tampa, uh, the Tampa stuff, some of the Stockholm stuff. A little bit of black metal. And then it was discovering metalcore through the German metalcore scene, actually. Heaven Shall Burn, Caliban, the, the first time I ever heard metalcore. And I started bringing that into our sound. And that kind of rounded it all off. So, yeah, that's, that was the path I've been in trivia since I was 13. So first band, really, first, first job, and wow, 20, I didn't realize. 22 that years cool. in now, 22 years in now, which is pretty nuts. Um, I actually think we, play, I, we either played a show together when you played with Reflux, or I was at the show, like when we first got signed to Life Force, it was New England Metal Hardcore Festival. Yeah. I don't remember what, do you remember, do you recall what it year? Have, you're right. It might have, was it Reflux or was it PSI? We never played the New England Metal Fest. No, we did the Jersey Metal yeah. Fest. No, uh, Matt, you're right. Yeah, I remember. I feel like I, yeah, I was aware of you guys at that time. And I feel like it was, it was New England and we were, a reflex was on it for sure. Yeah, I, I think you guys played the main room. I think we just got signed to Life Force and like my dad flew me up. I was like 16, 17, just to like meet the Life Force guys. I got to see Caliban in the small room. I watched Converge, watched you guys. I was actually- I didn't a, realize you were that young. Yeah, everyone always, everyone like, it's funny with our band when we were coming up, before we were always too young to get to tours, I remember Disturbed wanted to bring us on a Jägermeister tour and we weren't 21, so they didn't bring us out. We're like, okay, we can't bring those guys. And then, like, two years ago, there was a Texas station that was finally, like, kind of up for playing us. But they're like, remember the P- the program director asked our guy from Rotor, he's like, haven't those guys been around since, like, the 70s? And we're like, wait, what? So we were always either too young and then we were too old. So, yeah. But, yes, New England Metal, Cor- uh, Metal Hardcore Festival. I definitely saw you guys there. That was the first time I ever saw you play. Uh, which was pretty awesome, man. And, you know, you were talking about how Korn got you into want to play seven strings. That's the same thing for me. Like, I was into metal, but new metal started coming at the same time, 98, 99, getting to Slipknot, Limp Bizkit, Korn. So I was like, the seven string looks pretty cool. I picked it up. But then I discovered Dream Theater also has seven strings. So it was like that kind of union of super progressive and super aggressive and simple but it was you that inspired me to want to get an eight string when I started listening to Animals Leaders. And I was like, holy cow, what's this new range that he's discovered? And so, like, Madness of Many has been a huge influence on me. Like, and that's why, like, I hit you up originally. I was like, dude, you've got eight strings. I need to get one of your eight strings. And of course, 
got it right here. Nice. The, the incredible, incredible Ibaraki 8. But yeah, it's... I love to see that. I love to see when like different bands inspire people to pick certain things up. Like Javier, like when I see your classical videos or the things you do with classical guitar or Toast in the way you've kind of like changed the way someone would think about playing guitar. I think it's going to, it already has influenced so many new guitar players. I mean, if you guys look at the, the climate of the amount of instrumental bands that people are into now, that I believe that's really thanks to the two of you guys, which is so awesome. So it's kind of a side yeah. tangent. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Like, Instrumental guitar music, like you said, wasn't around when 99, 2000, all that stuff. Like, people weren't really playing solos. Solos kind of came back. But you, you'd never really think of kids getting into heavy stuff or kids into who are also into metalcore or metal or hardcore loving instrumental music. And I think that's from you guys. What was one of the driving forces? Like, why? Well, first of all, we should get from, from Reflux. But when you were doing that stuff, when did you decide, hey, I want to start playing something different. I want to start doing instrumental music, but differently. What was the decision or the path? Yeah. All right. So Reflux, you know, I'm glad you brought up New England Hardcore Metal Festival because that was like, like to me, all of the coolest bands were playing like that festival and various other things. Like Metalcore was emergent. I remember, you know, Hate Breed and then you know, Kill Switch engaged, like by the time they put out an out, it was just like the production and the vocals. It was just like, yo, this is, yeah. yeah. It just felt like this next level where like, oh, I think I could hear this on the radio, but there's breakdowns in it. This is crazy. <laughs> so um, I remember Reflux was basically attempting to be a metalcore band, but I was secretly listening to like Yngwie Malmsteen and like Steve Vai and stuff. So I was trying to put all sorts of stuff in there. I remember Unearth, Unearth would like do breakdowns and they would have like sweet picking yep. in it, right? Yep. And they played seven. So I was like, it's kind of what you're saying. The seven string was like very sort of fringe. And then the metal chord thing didn't really have like guitar solos. Like, I remember you guys did, but I perceived you as having more metal DNA than metal core in a lot of ways. So I was like, okay, that makes sense. But you know, there was just this hardcore thing where kids just wanted to, we called it dancing, but it's yep. like, they're just beating the crap out of each other. <laughs> um, so more of the story is Reflex ended up touring a bit and then um, disbanding. And I went to this music school in Atlanta. And that's where I was kind of like regrouping where like, what would my next project be? I was learning a lot about guitar. And I was convinced that I wanted to do a project that was instrumental, but like no distorted guitar. Like, it was just going to be like, yeah, like actually, the first demos of Animals as Leaders that I got, because I, I actually, I had quit music around yeah. that time, and I was like, I'm over fucking metal. Fuck metal. I'm like, yeah. fucking degenerates. <laughs> fucking over it. And he showed, he was just like, yo, I'm going to do this instrumental project. Do you want to be this other guitar, the other guitar player? And he sent, sends me this demo, and it was so not metal. It was like just kind of all over the place. We had like orchestral strings and like electronic <sighs> stuff. Yeah. So that was that was so basically reflux disbanded. I go to music school. Javi quit music, but we were kind of still in touch. I started making demos because through music school, I felt more confident just composing with no no vocals. I was like, okay, well, I could probably do a guitar album. I just didn't want to do a like solo guitar record as much as i wanted to make a band i don't know if you ever because you mentioned dream theory did you ever get into like liquid tension mm -hmm. experiment oh yeah yeah so it's like a kick-ass instrumental record that actually like everyone in the band sick you know it's not just like it's not just like someone just shredding every single song all over it yeah 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 but i was also in the bands like tortoise um which is an instrumental band i mean they literally have like freaking like marimbas and stuff it's like very like more of the story is i was trying to pull from electronic music like aphex twin and square pusher and bands like tortoise and try to like do a project that was instrumental but wasn't just like the tosin abasi experience um but uh i actually made some demos they were okay but they weren't great and then i hit up misha mansoor from periphery and i was like yo like are you down to produce this? Because it just didn't. It just didn't feel like it, it was. It like... didn't have a. There were all, the songs were so all over the place that didn't. It didn't really have like a place. Mm -hmm. You know, like one song was almost straight jazz. The other song sounded like it was made by Aphex Twin. The other song sounded like 
some it was just like i don't know two metal bands and fucking some pop singer got together um so literally it was misha really kind of gave it a place and a direction yeah put it put it this way like there was i was avoiding this distorted guitar and i was using a lot of electronic elements and then you know i took these demos of misha and he was like let's just re-record the parts and rearrange them and everything got heavier because Misha's just like, he just like metalized all these demos, but it, it really created this sound that was the intersection of, you know, ethereal sort of clean guitar layers, some electronic layers, and then very staccato rhythmic guitar for, and then leads. And, you know, Misha's drum treatment and his production, I mean, this is, I'm describing what emerged as kind of like a gent album, but at the time that we did it, like that was a kind of, funny word that was like on some obscure forums and no one had heard of it (laughs) but we just loved Meshuga, and so like basically that meeting point between Misha's production and the demos I had became the first animals as leaders and then showing Hav and he was just like okay yeah I mean I was like I I did not want to be in a metal band but I I heard and I was like fuck this is probably gonna be pretty pretty good (laughs) that's amazing i should probably do this yeah that's awesome (laughs) that's awesome um both been both your projects uh mestiz i I hope i'm saying that correctly am i saying that correct and mestiz and animals like both of those things like hearing the super clean tones you did was pretty unheard of like when i first started listening to you doing that i was like not many people are doing that for heaviness you know when you think of heavy you always think distorted but some of the stuff that all the stuff that you pull off that's meant to be heavy that's played and executed clean without a guitar pick I feel like it's just as heavy, if not heavier, because you feel that emotion coming through. And actually, that was a big inspiration on, I've got a black metal record I've been working on for like 10 or 11 years. And actually hearing your very clean tones made me write everything very clean. All the demos were actually like barely distorted, super clean guitar, but like tremolo picked and like kind of doing some weird stuff. And that was also like an inspiration from you guys. So it's cool to see like how people can inspire one another and start pushing and pulling different things. Um, you know, like the the riff from backpack five geist is that how you say it? backpack five geist yeah like it's you know that was a little bit heavier of the tone but still like it's cleaner than you'd expect and it's so damn heavy especially the so yeah like i've tried to watch your thump videos and i was like i i can't do this so later i'm gonna i'm gonna get it from you yeah actually i think the ingve stuff's easier the ingve stuff's easier than what the two you do um mestiz when did you start Javier, when did you pick up like classical guitar? Like when when did you start I, doing that? I kind of started with classical guitar. Um, so yeah, at six, my first teacher was a flamenco player, um, and I and now I don't, I don't consider myself a flamenco pay, player at all. But um, I did that for about like two years, and I switched over to this other teacher that was there learning like a bunch of rock. T- like it was actually like two years of Beatles curriculum. Um, but, but I only had a nylon string guitar. Um, so everything was on my nylon. And then I switched to another teacher who, who was this Argentinian um, guitar player. And he started te- teaching me this like Argentinian, Latin American folklorics type of stuff. So I never, you know, I never really did the classical school of music sort of thing. Um, it was more so the Latin folkloric stuff. Hmm. Um, so, and I, I kind of just kept on with it. Like I, I liked, I liked that it wasn't fucking like Baroque music. You know, it didn't feel like I'm studying box suites. Mm-hmm. It sounded, it was like you know, Afro-Cuban tunes, um, bossa nova stuff. And I'm like, all right, this is as a 10, 12 year old. I'm like, this is way cooler than fucking. Because I also used to take piano lessons. It was just like having a fucking study Chopin, and, yeah. and I was like, that's boring. This is not that much <laughs> boring. Um, so when it came to like with Misty stuff, you know, again, I, I had left, I had stopped playing, you know, kind of guitar for a good four years or something like that, three to four years. Um, I was in New York doing some studying. I came, moved back to DC and I picked up the guitar and right away I started with, with, uh, the Latin folkloric stuff. I went back to that same teacher. And it was like, oh shit, I forgot that I could do all this crazy shit. Um, and, you know, I kind of just went in hard with it. Like that's kind of, that's pretty much what I was doing when Tosin hit me up about animals. Um, I hadn't really written metal in forever. 
you know, um, I, I barely was listening to it. Um, I was listening to like world music, Latin music, fucking jazz, you know, things like tortoise and just my, my, my taste in music just kind of mushroomed, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to just like metal. Um, so when it came, to, you know, I mean, we were in the band, the band quickly, like kind of took off, right? We, we had one tour in the middle of that one tour. We had like a second, third tour, like all of a sudden booked, um, by the time we, we have our third tour, we ended up just moving to California. Um, so I'm, you know, animals is happening. I'm still like, how do I, how, where do I fit in? Like, what, what is my thing now? Like all of a sudden I'm this eight string fucking player. I, I play prog again, you know, what the fuck? Um, and I was like, how do I incorporate what I'm like naturally good at into something new? Um, I was always, I'm always a fan of having a unique sound, mm -hmm. you know, um, that was kind of one of the main things about animals was just like, nothing else sounds like this. I like that. Mo all the music that I like tends to be that way. I don't really care about genres anymore. Even within metal, I don't listen to a whole lot of it all. There's like probably like five, 10 bands that I may listen to. Um, and that's the same thing with jazz. That's the same thing with, you know, electronica, um, so I, I wanted to create something that was just always kind of unique, like that wasn't animals that, but you know, maybe there were some parallels, but sometimes there isn't such a, a you know, like a departure from it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's kind of a ways, you know, of me just again, incorporating what I appreciate about music, what I appreciate about guitar that isn't necessarily just like, let me go the craziest, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it's got different, different energy to it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. What you mentioned about like being inspired by other genres. You said Afro Cuban and the folkloric stuff. I was actually able to talk to Andreas Kisser from Sepultura the other day. And I was asking him about basically why and how they went from like, thrash Sepultura to where they started becoming, you know, Chaos AD and Roots and like what happened there. And he said for a while they kind of turned their back on what, what, where they were from. And he said he felt like an astronaut in space looking back down on himself. And he said, you know what, let's, let's tap into where we're from. Let's tap into Brazil and let's tap into the sounds of Brazil. And I think that that's when they like, you know, they really found themselves. So I think the same thing when you, are from something and start to draw on other influences from around the world. That's when things really become something unique and interesting and amazing. And that's what I've always felt like, yeah, no one else in the world sounds like animals as leaders and no one sounds like Mestiz. And I think that's such a really great thing. Um, now for the people out there that are fans of you guys, like what would you recommend were some of the starting points or the heroes of things that they should broaden their horizons with for whether it be jazz or a classical guitar or the folkloric stuff, like you mentioned, like what are a couple of the things that you'd recommend? um that's a good question uh it depends on what they're looking for uh but as far for let's say guitar in in the classical world you know um or nylon string i would say go check out yamandu costa um really, barrios agustin barrios mangore um villa lobos villa lobos uh paco de lucia um I mean, I mean that's pretty good you know start there and then you'll find your own little mushroom outside of that yo actually this guy adam rogers he's a he's a jazz guitarist but he studied he studied classical and he has some compositions where the harmony gets it's very angular and it's it's outside of what you'd hear um from some of the guys we just mentioned yeah. but it's very stimulating there's a there's a younger guy now antoine boyer oh man um man. french guy he's probably like 22 23 um genius epic genius um and combines literally like you can hear the classical you can hear the extreme jazz but you can also tell that he listens to like the beatles or like classic rock um and literally combines it all in extremely well very artful yeah um um, for jazz guys, uh, Kurt Rosenwinkel, Jonathan Kreisberg, Adam Rogers. Pat Matheny. Yeah. I feel like these guys are at the vanguard where some of the harmony and the technique you're hearing 
it seems like they're not really concerned with tradition in the same way a lot of jazz players are. They're pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. Like there's chops and there's some some pretty advanced harmony. Um, and then like Alan Holdsworth, if you know if anyone yeah. on the stream has not heard Alan Holdsworth, like he was an alien who blessed us yes. on Earth for a while, and then he peaced out. Uh, and then for the metal stuff, I have a short list that I think are quite essential, but I think if you get an album, like get like 300% density from Candiria, I mean, there's literally trumpet on that album, <laughs> like, but it's one of the heaviest things ever. Record. Dude, it's like, that album's crazy. And then uh, I, Chaos Sphere, I'd say get Chaos Sphere by Meshuggah. Cities by Strapping Young Lad. Woo. Um, that, to me, that's a timeless one. Um, yeah. I still put it on. I'm like, God, really? damn. I should, I should listen. To that it's, shit. it still is heavier than most shit. It's like a storm. Like you're being sandblasted. Yeah. Just like, I gotta, um, I'm gonna check that one out. I have, I actually, I haven't heard that one in Chaos Fear. I haven't heard of that. I haven't wow. thought of that was his high school. That was my, my wake up music for high school. Like I had it like the giant boombox and it set off at like 6:30 a.m. and that was the record that I have wake me up every day. Yeah. Yeah. That so for me, the sugar changed how i listened to metal and music mm -hmm. like i had zero clue what odd meter i mean i knew about rush and i knew about like dream kansas theater. And, and dream theater but i didn't and i knew that was odd meter but i didn't like when i first heard i i first heard uh Meshuggah because they were opening up for slayer at the 9 30 club in dc and I, I i walk in and i'm like what the fuck is happening uh, I couldn't, my brain could not comprehend what was happening. And I remember going home that day and trying to write something like that. It, it was just like, all right, just take out a beat, like a okay. quick one, <laughs> you know? Well, so it, it's, it's cool that you're mentioning the difference in approach to odd meter, of like rush versus Meshuggah, because, you know, you'd hear these conspicuous resets. So like, you know, with old school Prague, you'd, you could count to seven and then the drummer would start over. You'd, you'd hear this loop. Mashuga carried a, an imposed quarter note a, across many measures. And so that reset didn't occur every five beats or every seven, whatever. It started to feel like the riff was cycling weird over time. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that is there. That is where it was like, whoa, yeah, this is man. different than like. It changed, it changed the game up for me. Like, mm -hmm. I. And it, it, dude, I think they set the standard for how tight things are now yep. too. Just like, you know, we're, we gents came up earlier, but that like the, just the slicey crispiness of the palm mutes, like yep. Meshuggah just like took that to the next level. They've know? spawned so much stuff too, but, and I wonder if they know about it. Like, it seems like maybe they don't, like, I'm, I'm not really I, sure. I, they, Bro, they, they do. do. We've okay. done shows with them. I've just punished them. So <laughs> yeah. for the guys, people on the stream, like, I, yo, do you, I don't know if your band has this term, but like, if you ever get a fan who just really enthusiastic and kind of won't shut up it's like we call them punishers we love we love we got punisher and i've also heard the term strapper like you're getting strapped like a backpack that was ah. someone else taught us that one yeah everyone's got their own so i'm a, i'm a punisher to Meshuggah, and i'm like dude dude do you guys do you guys know that when you put out that album man this that or the other just like <laughs> there's a japanese term for that uh called otaku and that's what i am for like all bands that are things that i'm into like I've talked about how we've toured a lot with our favorite bands and every time I've gone up and like complimented them or something, like especially maybe the European ones or like the Swedish bands, like, Hey man, this record, I had this poster on my wall. I bought your eBay videos because you wouldn't tour in Orlando. I was like, okay, I got to go now. I'll see you later. <laughs> like I'm, I'm the guy that does that to every other band. Cause I feel like it's important. Like uh, not, not to like go into like a sad territory, but I just did an interview yesterday about our new record and they asked me about Alexi Laiho. They, they mentioned Alexi Laiho. And I said, it's it's terrible because I didn't hear their new record until he passed. And I listened. I was like, wow, this is one of the best records that I've ever done because their first three were huge, huge influences for us. But I'm so happy. In 2005, we did a tour. That was actually our toughest tour, one of our toughest tours of our career. It was Children of Bodom headlining, Trivium Direct Support, and a Monomarth opening, who's now a freaking arena band. So it was that across North America. I mean, we played San Francisco. The entire crowd booted us and spit on us the entire show. Like, we did rough tours. Like, this is back when, like, bands still got bullied by fans and other bands. We did a Dillinger Skate Plan tour. It was Dillinger, The End, Red, Yellow, Trivium opening. That was 2004. We played a show. The entire crowd left the floor and turned their backs to us for the whole show. When we did the Lamb of God Trivium Machine Head Gojira tour, I had people waiting outside our bus to want to fight me. They said, good show, James. I was like, 
what do you mean? Like James Hetfield, good show. You want to go like like that kind of stuff. So we had a weird upbringing, but so I'm glad on the 2005 run with Bodum. It's the last show. I was like, finally, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go punch this guy. I walked in. I was like, dude, I own every record, every T-shirt, everything. I started talking about the vinyls, talking about like guitar parts that I loved or souls I loved, and they're like. He's like, I had no idea. He's like, thank you so much. Like, we did the six week run. I never mentioned it till then. So I like doing that. I like telling people like what I'm a fan. That's why like I was telling the two of you like I appreciate the music. It influenced me to do things and never lose that. I think that's a great thing. I think it's a good thing because I, yeah, no, I, I, I like that you're still part fan. Like, mm-hmm. and you're impacted by music on that level. I totally feel you. And yeah, I will punish certain bands. I'll be good. like, dude. Like, I, I think people always I need to let you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I always do that. I always do it. Always, yeah. always. But I guess we should we should talk a little bit too about our our mutual friends, Fishman. Because I have two of the guitars with your pickups, Tosin. They sound really, really, really good. Sometimes better than my other ones. Why is that? What did you do differently to your pickups? <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I focused on. All right, let me let me. I feel like say you have a bridge humbucker you and you play metal you want a degree of clarity out of it you don't want it to be too like muddy in the low end essentially you want like a lot of mids and you want that output to kind of hit the amp in a way where you get saturation but it's not too much so like i didn't feel like i needed to focus that much on like say like the bridge humbucker sound what i was obsessed with was the cleans like you mentioned and the split coil sounds because our stuff you know we started getting into the stumping technique and it really shines when you have a pickup that essentially sounds like a single coil. Mm -hmm. Um, It just hypes the top end and the low end. It kind of scoops the middle and it's just, it just, it's a night and day difference for the slap technique and for tapping too. And so my whole thing was to voice it as like the best sort of split and single coil without it being actually that I didn't want the noise. I didn't want Mm -hmm. some of the hum, but uh, moral of the story is, yeah, I actually referenced like some Telecasters and damn, like, damn. you know, strangely enough, Greg Cock is another Fishman guy. He's got a set. And I, I kind of use his as like a template too, but I just wanted to pick up that, um, I say hyper clean sometimes, you know, like a crystal, almost like it's not piezo, but it's the distance. It's like the middle ground between a really um, like a piezo being here and a traditional, you know, clean pickup. You know, I, I've got this thing in the middle that I think it's just like brand new string sound. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's essentially like, I feel like that's kind of the where my pickups really kind of show themselves as, as being different. You that's know? awesome. Yeah. And that just reminded me too. You, you guys are also the reason why I'm obsessed with split coil now. Like I've, I collect guitars and make sure they've got a split coil sound yeah. and I'm just obsessed with that. So now you reminded me that I also got that from you, which is, which well, is bro, really when cool. you start tuning down, it's kind of a secret weapon. Mm-hmm. You go to the split coil, you take a little bit of the gain out yeah. and it just growls yeah. and it's, it's got teeth. It well, really it, does. It, yeah. it's, it's, I, I think it's happened naturally with, uh, I was actually talking to a buddy the other day about it, like never played eight string and then started playing an eight string and was just like, you know, he was hooked, he was used to hooking up to a diesel and it was just like, it's always too much gain. And then started dialing it back. And I was like, oh, this is how you have to, mm-hmm. you know, this is how you make it sound good. Like, I, I think naturally with the extended range, in order for it to not sla- sound like just, you know, a bunch M- of muddy tuba, muddy fucking sh- hiss happening. Yeah. Um, you, you need to dial that back. And then naturally with the technique that we're doing between the thumping and the selective picking, I think the only way to really hear that clear, clear and for it to have that percussive sound is with a single coil. Mm-hmm. Um, any or t- pickups that get you close to single coil, right? Like voicing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Javier, for your pickups, what kind of difference did you do on those? Um, to me, Tosin's pickups were like the extreme, are on the extreme side of of that super chimey sort of thing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it's it's still definitely less than that piezo sort of thing because that piezo to me is like only sounds good like as a piezo clean sort of thing. Whereas Tosin's pickup, um, you can drive it right. Uh, for me, I w- I consider myself more like I I wanted to have that but also complement my finger picking because. Um, I, you know, I do, that's kind of my strong point. That's kind of where, 
what I like when I when I'm at home I play mostly with my fingers you know then I use a pick um, mm. so I wanted to have a little bit of that kind of dial back on that chiminess um, and also I, I was t- trying to think of like a, a overall pickup like w- how can this one pickup do everything that I needed to do um, so it, it kind of has a set like in the uh, bridge position it kind of has this darker voice for like getting closer to what a traditional humbucker sounds like um, but then in 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 the other voice it's a little brighter kind of more for what we need in animals right mm-hmm. um, I still have that single coil stuff my neck pickup is actually a lot of low end a lot of brightness but then my second voice almost like has this extreme roll off and it kind of sounds like a uh, like a jazz a, box like a jazz it? yeah like a semi hollow um, and again, I wanted to just create something, one, create something unique, kind of highlight the ability of Fishman, you know, because uh, it's kind of unlike anything that I've ever seen on a guitar. Um, and it actually sounds really good. And then, you know, through just messing around uh, with different tones, it's kind of endless, the amount of um, variety that I get out of it. So, I mean, in total with both guitars, it's like, it's two pickups, but you're getting like seven eight different voicing mm-hmm. you know what i mean yeah there's different combinations yeah Yo, are, cool. you, are you doing a set matt i am um but mine's me because i think the moderns are perfect for what i do and for what i like can push for like modern metal sound it's basically the modern voice except it's three voice so it's gonna have it's gonna have this the active passive and the split sorry my, my kid's saying hi thanks buddy thank you I, i'm good i'm good <laughs> did we got the cameras on man <laughs> i'll see you a little bit uh, 20 minutes. You got animals as leaders? <laughs> yep, that's what he said. He's got a shirt on. He's got a shirt on. <laughs> but yeah, so it's going to be the moderns, but um, it has the split coil built into it this time, which is awesome. Because right now it's two voice. Dude, that's that's kind of it's kind of how they should have came. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because the first set I tried were moderns. I put them in a guitar, and I was like, these are crazy. Because the moderns have a really cool sort of mid hump. I just found that like, we were on tour and we were recording some of our shows and my lead sounded clearer. And I was like, dude, these are crazy, but it didn't have the split. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, oh, I can't ultimately use these because it's missing that voicing. So yeah, the fact yeah. that you kind of combine um, that, I think is. Well, I got into splits because of you and I'm, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. Like I just got a nine string built by Red Layer Guitars. It's an incredible builder in Holland. And wow. I saw someone playing a nine. I was like, all right, maybe this is too much, but I need to see this through. So I ordered one from him and it's freaking nuts. Like you do like double drop B for it. So like seven string will then have a, a lower octave on it. That you have to have the gain really dialed back, but the split coil on it is unbelievable. Like it sounds, it's just so fun. Like it almost makes me want to hear you two play on a nine string. <laughs> we actually, uh, back, uh, not back, uh, Glass Bridge. The Glass Bridge is a nine string song. That's right. So, so shit, yeah. maybe that's Tosin your, broke, Tosin your broke out a nine string and I was like, man, fuck this, dude. <laughs> so, so all my all my parts on that song are on a six string. Yeah. I was like, I'm gonna go the opposite, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Um, well, I think what as we get to this spot, well, I gotta say one more thing too, because of all my guitars I always play, one of my main moderators on my channel is always like that one sounds the best. So he's finally getting like he's trying to decide on the pickups, but it's a it's an Aristides that has your Tosin pickups for the sevens, and it sounds better than all of my other guitars. So he's buying. I don't know if he's in here right now, but he's like, what are those pickups? I'm buying those. Uh, so that's that's a good thing. You got a sick ass collection now, man. I've got a couple. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah, Yeah. I'm just an an otaku, man, a nerd. I think it's I think it's great, especially with what you're doing, like the amount of streaming and performing and writing. It's the fact that you're this passionate about all of the things. Thanks, it just, man. <laughs> it's just like legit. You know? It's just that super geek Japanese thing, that otaku vibe. I'm just I gotta gotta catch them all, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we split, I, I I think we should do a little technique, little technique. Now you guys already know everything, and like when I was listening, I was re-listening to Mestis and Animals today. So first question is like the hell do you think and write like that and i'm sure that's a much longer question than that but i have something i want to show you guys so i'm sure you know how to do it it's not like a techie thing but it's something that i consider one of my ingredients where i picked it up off of was a guy named daniel mongrain and i think you'll actually love his band a lot so band called martyr m-a-r-t-y-r he's super into holdsworth super it's like tech death jazz French Canadian. Yeah, is it is it Martyr A D? No, Martyr no. M A R T Y R. They're from French Canada, and 
all his solos are Holdsworth style. Yeah, but I know I remember, that. Man. Yeah, I met him. He was a big influence. Like our stuff doesn't sound like it, but Ascendancy, the way I started learning through the interesting, weird drop D chords and kind of getting into strange time and strange meter was from him. This dude can play every Marty Freeman solo perfectly, but he's also, I think he's in Voivod now. He's the guitar player of Voivod, Daniel. Um, so I learned it from him and a little bit from Chuck Schuldner, just from their influence. Now, we all know like alternate picking, down, up, down, up, down picking. But it's down, 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 up, down. It's a technique I use a lot. So when I switch headphones, I'll just show it to you, and then I'll, I'll talk about it real quick. One sec. So I can't hear you when I switch because it's two systems. But it's pick-based. But I was like, I was thinking hard, what can I show these two masters of the instrument that maybe something that they don't always always necessarily do? Now, I love this thing. So it's so down, 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 down. So down, down, down. I think it's just so much more interesting than but it could work anywhere just like that so I was like I'll show them down 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 up down because whenever I'm brought up to about like showing someone something <laughs> oh sorry one second i'm back so down 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 up, down. i don't know how that would Dude. translate to fingers but i think it's a cool little thing it um it cut out the, the your guitar audio cut out for us but from what the parts that i heard it sounded oh really no it good. cut out maybe it was it was over gaining or something i think uh, it's just zoom sometimes is not good with like the high audio but oh. yeah when you described it i was like i'm like what would you use that for and then you started playing i was like oh it's sick for rhythms for that particular mm -hmm. type of yeah, the, the articulation you were getting in that pattern. Yep, it, it makes sense. You have a very staccato attack sometimes, and I feel like it has that same approach. It almost feels like like a Hans Zimmer kind of symphonic thing or like a John Williams Star Wars thing. Maybe that's yeah. what it's from. Maybe it's John Williams that invented the down, 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 down. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded good. What are you using for uh, for for amp stuff? What were, you, um, what were you just playing out of? Right now, it's a six-band EQ into an overdrive. It's a KHDK, that Kirk Hammett company that me and Corey have a little limited run. So ah. an overdrive, NS2, and that's a block letter 5150. So it's the old school, and that's into a Captor X. So we just switched to Captor Xs. I love those things. We're using Kempers for a long time, used Axe Effects way back, but now we're back up being all about real heads, real pedals, but the sim at the end because it just Bro. makes it super tight. That's why I was asking because it it has a thing. Oh, it really it has does. a thing. It's got that we, beef. Yeah, not only like is it gonna feel different for you, but we we've, we've been recording like Hobbs mixing, and we we normally have just defaulted to the fractals or whatever, but we um, started reamping our DIs into real heads, and it's kind of crazy. Yeah, we did we did one song, and then we were like, just how different it felt. We were like. I guess we have to go and yep. do it to the rest of the album. So it's all real. So I That's feel awesome. you. Even even on tour, bro, like I'm doing heads and pedals. Like, yep. yeah. Yep. Yeah, we, we gave it up. I remember a couple of years ago, and I've got a couple of friends in here that will have to have a quote. It was like me saying, all right, I'm done with pedals. I'm done with real heads. Like, who needs this stuff? I want my I want my rig to be the size of my phone. But then one day, Core's like, hey, man, just check out this head real quick. And I think it was an old 5152. And I played through it, and you feel what it is. It's the same thing with the reason why the three of us love Fishman pickups. Like, I feel like there's no latency in the playing. You know, sometimes there's gear where it feels like it's latent, and I feel like sometimes the modelers have that, or maybe suites have that. But when you're playing through a head, the, the audience might hear the same thing. But I feel like it's so instantaneous, and you feel that bass reflex between you and the gear. Like, uh, we just did pre-production today. Um, we're doing 5153 stealths into the captors. And we've never had guitar tone like this ever. It's just so intensely, it's like getting hit with a wall in a good way. And it's tight and it's articulate and not over gained. Um, but yeah, I think that's I think that's the key. Like just cutting out the, the last part. I've talked to a couple of producers. They're like, yeah, in the studio, I would use a cab sim or a mic cab. And they're basically the same. He's like, why not just do the capture at that point? Yeah, cool. you get a bit, bit more consistency. We went in straight up, you know, dual mic that we did the old school way. But you were doing some... Some profiles right with the yeah i mean we <laughs> I, I mean it's so, so much of it i think it has to do with like the miking it the room and all that shit because after after grabbing you know doing all the the reamping we ended up grabbing the profiles of the amps and and the cab for the um for the kemper 
and it was kind of like, fuck, this sounds really good. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, it, but, it, be, it, but it's like what you said. The crowd may just be like, this tone sounds great, but you on stage, yep. you tracking, you writing, that connection to a fire breathing amp yep. is like, oh. That really is yeah, everything. I, yeah. Totally. I, I think, I mean, as, as I, I love the fractal, I, and I, I think the Kemper is great too. And I think, you know, the for, Helix is sick. They're, they're all really, really good. You know, um, I think they're amazing tools, but it's, it's going to be really hard to find like that direct component. I mean, it's like, you know, getting a fucking the best car simulator that you can get versus actually being on the car and feeling real yep. g-forces yeah absolutely you know? absolutely like i felt like there was something i think it was because of streaming because i was playing a lot more than i used to and still it's been keeping that going but before i didn't like it was getting the job done playing on our rigs that we were doing like modeling and stuff and i as soon as i plugged into real head and a real cab at the studio again and feeling that like hitting me where it's like almost too loud or like this almost like feels dangerous i felt like i was playing like i was when i was 16 all over again it was like me and my 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 parents house like jamming in front of a real amp and feeling that well, and it, yeah rumbling. and it made me Dude, feel, I, I love that dangerous yeah yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah that's what it felt like and it just felt right and i feel like i've been playing more fun and wanting to make different kinds of parts because of feeling that organic vibe but just getting rid of the part that wasn't fun like it wasn't fun miking a cab in this tiny room that i stream out of so just having that end of it being perfect it's it's set yeah so for my question from you guys how do i do the thump like what is what do i do <laughs> i've got a crazy thumb it it does all sorts of things oh wow. so like it should be able to do something right and the You're I'm halfway like, there but this is from jujitsu. You have it's really bad. long fingers. Yeah, bro. look at this guy. It's you like broke an, your finger. It's like an elder wand. Yes, jujitsu. I, I wear these gloves now. That are better. Like, <laughs> it makes it like Yo, Dan, Danny DeVito from the Penguin. My right girlfriend there. just started doing jujitsu, and I'm curious. But the first thing I asked him, I was like, "Yo, I play guitar." Yeah. He was you, like, "Yeah." He was like, "We have some surgeons who come, and they they do it, and they're fine." Nah. But I saw um Zoltan from fucking Five Finger does jujitsu. Yeah, I think he's like a black belt or something, but he tapes his hand in a particular I way. I was doing, I did the taping for a long time and I had my professor teach me this tape way that like what it ended up doing is giving me cauliflower finger. So the taping makes the, the blood pool in these spots. So I actually found the taping is fine, but if you get an injury when it's taped, it's maybe worse. So the company that I started wearing their gloves, it was called Graps, G-R-A-P-P-Z. And it's like a, a little glove that keeps your fingers basically buddy taped. I think it's so much, but I use tape for so long and it wrecked my fingers. And the style of jujitsu I do is called spider guard. Like back when I was doing the, a lot of gi stuff and it's a lot of gripping, but nowadays I stick to no gi, which means there's no, like, there's no karate gi that you're like gripping on with. It's just like normal clothes and your finger won't get caught up in a, yeah. And I feel like the, if you're ever going to try it, wear those gloves, it's not worth doing this. This still aches and it's like two years. So yeah, you can't be messing around. No, with it's the worst hobby for a guitar player and for a guitar player singer, it's even worse because chokes are involved at that point. But Damn. what is the, the okay. mechanism? First I'm going to, okay. So having a bit of nail is helpful. It's similar to classical guitars. You want, you want your nail length to go, a little bit past the, the flesh of your thumb. Okay. That dude, that helps a lot because uh, it's just going to be a sharper transient and the actual way it, uh, it doesn't snag on the string the same way your, your thumb might because your thumb is soft. And so when you strike it, you want a bit, you almost want an angle where you're getting some nail and some, some flesh. Okay. I, I kind of explain to people sometimes, you know, when we pick a normal, use a normal pick, the flat side of the pick is is what's going against the guitar. Mm -hmm. Imagine it if it were like perpendicular, or like forty five degrees, or, or like a forty five degree, right? So as, I'm gonna maybe use a bigger. Interestingly, pick. I kind of pick like that uh, on purpose, adding that little kind of scrape to it. Maybe it's not yeah. forty five, yeah, exactly. but it's like a subtle like five degrees more. So with your with when you're using your thumb, you want a little bit of the nail and a little bit of the skin, almost kind of doing that angle. Mm -hmm. So it's not like going up and down but it's this weird sort of angles sort of mm -hmm. thing. Okay. almost okay. perpendicular but yeah around 45 degree angle and then um i would consider locking your thumb almost like thumbs up like hitchhiker yeah and then the motion is more of like a turning from the wrist okay. yeah you rarely you rarely move the actual thumb okay like the thumb does not move it's most of it is coming from the wrist the wrist 
and even you know depending on how hard you're going to be going like you can start including your elbow and the idea is also to be able to do that more than kind of like think of doing this fast okay. yeah so turning motion and you can slow it down and almost pretend like you want to strike the string beneath the one you're actually hitting almost so, like the the muting of like classical kind of but with the, you do those, those fingers exactly yeah, yeah. so like a rest stroke but in reverse but it's almost like your target is the the adjacent string below the one you're hitting okay um also i i think the left hand actually plays a, a really important part that is easily overlooked because especially when you're learning it's easy to start getting the other strings to just fucking vibrate and start mm -hmm. creating a bunch of noise so as you're doing this sort of stuff, uh, you know, working on the right hand stuff, use your left hand to mute everything else. Okay. Because awesome. uh, otherwise it just starts sounding like, you know. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, don't even worry about fretting an actual note. I, I used to just mute, I'd mute around the second fret of my lowest string and just try to get that percussive sound going. And you plug in, you plug in your left hand later, you know. Okay. But uh, I should just send you a link to my, I mean, I have this thump course or whatever. I'll just send you a that'd download. Be, code that'd be it. awesome. Yeah, because I like checked yeah. out all the YouTube videos. I was like, I can't get this. But I think I was do. I was trying to move the thumb joint was the problem. I think it was yeah, I think that's, I think that's the most, I, I think that's natural for people to want to do. Because I mean, I think when we when we alternate pick, we're we're using a, a lot more of our, our mm -hmm. you know, thumb joint than, than you do completely. I mean, it's almost zero thumb joint. You almost want to be pretty kind rigid. of locked almost yeah yeah this stuff will evolve once you start getting fast you will find uh smaller movements in these joints but i think for learning conceptually you just want to think of hitchhiker turn key at the wrist mm -hmm. and just kind of strike per, um 45 degree angle okay the, the last thing is tone because you could be doing it right but if you're like on your neck pickup it's just going to sound kind of like woolly yeah. like you want to be on like uh if you have a five-way selector like position two or position four okay yeah with the split, with the split coil exactly because okay. a lot of the sound is in the voicing of the pickup awesome actually. awesome like, but this would work even on a strat so it's... awesome i'll, I'll check on a strat, out. it's actually really good yeah, yeah. awesome i'll yeah. work on that i'll work on that and when my black metal record comes out i'll show you the section i did like a cheat of it's not thumping but it's me using a pick to simulate the thumping with the tapping and i'll show yeah. you that when it's out it's like if that's kind of my i, was like, I can't figure this out when i make something up so oh I'll that's super that. sick yeah by the way i have to shout out your guitar the, the snowfall oh yeah yeah that thing i was wanting to ask you because i don't know if you've seen this it's like it's like a Les Paul. But it's like all white, even the fingerboard. Yeah. So how did how did you? I actually think aesthetically, it's so clean. Thank you. Like that you did that, especially that you got the fingerboard to be like that. I how like what material is on the the fingerboard? I need to check. I think someone in here is gonna know better than me. But the idea came about. So I had my signature Les Paul custom. My, like my dad, before he had a son, he knew he wanted a son that played a Les played a Les Paul custom. So I think it was like genetically imprinted to play one. But we did a music video where we took one of my old. Oh, it's phenolic phenolic ah, yeah okay we did a music video where like hey matt do you have an extra one of your guitars like well i have the original prototypes and they just poured white paint all over it like completely doused it and i was like i want a guitar that looks like that and i showed up phones like let's do this but what's really cool about the one you have and the old old editions we're never making those again so those are like uh -huh. super they're, they're rare now so the next year models are completely different they're, they'll be white and gold more like a normal les paul custom but that one is like doesn't exist anymore it's the only one like that yeah, yeah. It's they've, the only guitar I've seen that is like, literally, it creates such a minimal and clean look. I was like, damn, this is really smart. Awesome. So, Thank you so good much. Good job with that. Appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome, guys. Well, it was a freaking blast chatting. Thank you so much for the insights and lesson stuff and letting everybody know all this great stuff. And yeah, it was an amazing Thanks chat. Thanks for having us on. Thank dude. you so much, our friends. Great to see you guys. Great yes. chat. Stay in touch, my friends. Yeah. Bird. Take Thank care, you so man. much. Later, guys. All right, everybody. That was amazing. Let's run this other thing real quick. Def pointed about not showing the controls, but I don't think I have the capability of doing that. Hey, it's Thomas McLaughlin, and this is my Fishman Triple Play. What I love about Triple Play is the fact that I can play my favorite virtual instruments on the instrument that I'm most comfortable on. So the fact that I can play chords like this 
is insanely cool to me. Yeah, I actually do have one of those. I just haven't installed it yet, so I'm freaking pumped. Uh, Ken and Fishman sent me one of those. So I, I've got it right there, but we'll probably install it after this next tour. Um, but it's a perfect time to announce that McRocklin and I will be doing the next Fishman by Kichi, I think next next week. Next week, so stay tuned to that. And um, he's going to be writing something off the triple play. I'm going to write stuff underneath it, whether it's vocals or guitar or drums or whatever the hell it is. I have one. I'm stoked. I'm even more stoked now. So this has been Fishman and Kichi Presents. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Matt Hafey here. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to check out my Twitch live, you can check it out right here. Hit that follow button. Notifications on. Make sure you also subscribe to the Fishman YouTube. Subscribe now. I look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you very much.